Welcome to Simply by Grace, a podcast of Grace Life Ministries with founder and director, Dr. Charlie Bing. This podcast and other helpful resources can be found at our website, gracelife.org. Now, here's Dr. Bing. Father, we ask today that you would speak to us and uh, grant us the grace to see what you uh, want us to see from this story of the cross and the ones who were with Jesus there. We'll commit our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Luke 23, in a message I call Never Too Late, Lessons from the Thief on the Cross. But before I get that, I'll just show you a couple slides here of what we've been doing while you're turning. We have a podcast. I think we're about on our, I don't know, 140th episode of that. And it's in the top 10% of all podcasts, not just religious podcasts. So I'd encourage you to look it up get that QR code here or back there. And um, we, we do, you know, this, this message will probably end up on there, but we do stories about every other week about how people have been changed by the grace of God. So you'll find them very interesting. People have really liked that. And I just uh, completed uh, an expanded edition of my book, Fishing for Life, uh, which I really, uh, I like to fish, as I said. And when I found out that there was no books written, that present to fishermen the gospel, uh, and then I found out that fishermen can read, I decided to write this book. <laughs> and the older version, if I brought it before, I had like 20 chapters, now it's got 26 chapters, and those chapters contain the stories of the biggest fish I've ever caught, so I'm gonna have to leave one for Robert, I guess, or something, but anyway, you might look that over, that's been fun. And then we have a Grace Life app that we just, uh, kind of unveiled a couple weeks ago, and it's got everything at your fingertips, grace notes, messages, uh, outlines of every book of the Bible, uh, pot, take you to your podcast. We've got the grace notes, for example, in seven different languages right now. So that's exciting too. You can get all that by just going up there, there's a QR code on the table that you can easily scan, and, um, or just go to gracelife.org and it'll, you'll, you'll end up there. So that's kind of what's going on. We have been able to get back on the road since post-COVID, you know, things shut down quite a bit. So we restarted our Grace Life Institute in Ghana, West Africa this summer in July. And um, we, we started our Grace Life Institute, which is a week of training with 50 pastors and leaders. And uh, they're very excited about that. That went very well. I also did a conference in the second largest city called Kumasi in Ghana for about 300 pastors and leaders um, and that went very well and these were the f this is the first time these people had heard the message of God's grace and many of them you know don't have assurance of salvation they don't know that they're going to heaven but when we left we left many of them rejoicing with that security that assurance of salvation it really changed their lives they got really excited about it I was able to get on the radio and, and talk to the whole city of Kumasi on the biggest radio station there as well and we visited the chief in his palace and uh, invited him to our meetings and he came. So he was able to hear the message too. That's just a brief report of what we did this summer. So Luke chapter 23 um, talks about a thief. I met a thief on my first trip to Ghana in West Africa. It was my first mission trip actually with my wife and my one-year-old baby. We spent the summer of 1985 there and I went there to teach at a Bible college and uh, and we lived on a compound, which is kind of a wall, and there's several homes inside with some other missionaries. Well, one day I was out uh, in the yard and I heard quite a commotion coming down the street, and it was a large crowd of people, maybe 50 or 60 people, and paraded in front of them was a tall African fellow, and he was shirtless and he was covered with dirt and dust and blood. And people were walking alongside of him with sticks and hoses and machetes and kind of ha having a lot of fun with this guy who was obviously in great misery. And I didn't know what was going on. And I said, what's, I asked one of the house boys, uh, what's going on? And he said uh, that they caught a thief. And you know, they don't take thieves very kindly there. And you don't call the police usually because the police will let them off if they give them a cut. So you, they take justice into their own hands. and. From somebody from a different culture, you don't know really what you should do. So, you know, well, 
like to help the guy, but they're doing things their way. So they walk around to the other side, and then the, the houseboys started to say to me, they're going to bend him, they're going to bend him. And I said, bend him? I didn't know what they meant. It was a horseshoe road, so he comes around to the other side of the compound, and then one of the missionaries who was living on that side came over to me. He said, oh, did you see the thief that they're parading? They're going to burn him. I said, burn him? Well, then we need to go and share the gospel with him. <laughs> so we went over there into the crowd, and now he was laying on the ground, and he had a tire around his neck filled with kerosene. It's called a Nigerian necklace. And there was a boy with a pack of matches jumping around, smiling, getting ready to light the match. So we walked into the middle of this, this other missionary and I, and we said, we're Osofu, that means pastors. We're, we're Osofu, can we talk to you a minute? Who, who is it that charges this man with theft? Nobody said anything. Who is this that witnessed him steal something? Nobody said anything. We couldn't get a witness. And so Rick continued to talk to them and reason to them. He, he tried to send somebody to go get his truck. And the meanwhile, I knelt down and I talked to the man in the dirt. And I said, what is your name? He said, Benjamin. I said, Benjamin, I may not be able to save you from this crowd, but I can tell you how to be in heaven forever. Do you understand? Yes, he could barely acknowledge things. I said, we are all sinners. We've all broken God's rules of justice, and, but God loves you, and he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you and to pay that penalty for your sins. And then Jesus rose from the dead, and he's alive today. And even if you were to die and be, but believe in him, you can be with him forever. Do you understand that? And he said, yes. We weren't able to get much beyond a 60 second conversation and the truck was able to back up and amidst the protests of the crowd, we were loaded them into the truck and we drove them off to a hospital and uh, which are not like today's hospital, it's more like an open shared shed with screen sides and we visited him the next day but he had fled because they don't take good care of you in the hospital, some of those situations. The point is, is that here was a man near the end of his life and he was able to hear the gospel and give some hope to him. I don't know where he is today. Maybe we'll see him in heaven if he truly understood and believed what I had said. Well, it's never too late. This man was about to, to get burned to death, but he heard the gospel. There was another man who was near the end of his life and he hung on a cross next to Jesus along with another criminal and he also had an experience. The two criminals, of course, had different views of who Jesus was. And I would just like to read that story with you from Luke chapter 23. And uh, of course, some things have happened in the cro uh, at the cross already. And Jesus is hanging there to the two are on each side, one on each side. And so we come into the midst of that story and it says, and an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who was, were hanged blasphemed him saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him saying, do you not even fear God, seeing that you're under the same condemnation? And we, indeed justly, for we, we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. It's a short story. Now, Matthew and Mark and Luke have the story. Matthew and Mark use a different word to refer to him. The word that they use kind of means robber or insurrectionist. Luke uses a word that means criminal or an evildoer. So it, we don't know exactly what his crime was. We do know he was a bad guy. Okay, that's all we need to know. He was a bad guy and the Romans thought he was worthy of death. 
I want to make some observations as we think through this story because it teaches us a lot about God's grace in salvation, who and how he saves people and how he works in lives. And uh, because there's so much misunderstanding about, um, about salvation today in the gospel and what Jesus does for us and what we have to do to be saved. So let me make some observations. First of all, what did the thief know at this point in his life? near the end of his life. First of all, he knew he was a sinner because he said to the other thief, you know, we are being condemned uh, and, and we're guilty, to paraphrase. He knew he was guilty, whereas the other thief didn't want to own up to it so much. So he knew he was a sinner. And secondly, he knows that he deserves the condemnation because of his sins. So there's a sense in which when we are coming to Jesus Christ as Savior, Savior from what? Well, it's Savior from our sins. We have to have a sense that we have fallen short of God's glory and that because of that, we deserve divine justice upon us, which would be God's condemnation because of those sins. And he understood this in his honest moment. He recognizes that he's not worthy of Jesus's mercy. He didn't act like he deserved it at all. He just recognized that he wasn't worthy of it. And he recognizes Jesus' innocence because when the other thief condemned him and, and mocked Jesus, you know, uh, he, this thief stood up for him and said, this man has done nothing wrong. So he knew that Jesus was innocent somehow. How? I don't know. Maybe he had followed him. You know, Jerusalem was not really a big place in those days. And, and news gets around and People could see and hear him pretty easily. And then he witnesses Jesus' forgiving spirit towards the severe sinners that were around him, mocking him and the ones who crucified him. Because it says in the paragraph above that Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they don't, don't know what they're doing. And that must have made some impression on this man hanging next to him that Jesus would look down at these people and, for, and ask God to forgive them in spite of the fact that he was being so tortured. This is all being processed by this thief uh, as he watches. He acknowledges Jesus is the Lord, the King of the Jews, and thus the Messiah. That's what's on that placard, Jesus, the King of the Jews. Although it was put there uh, almost to mock him, this thief recognized that uh, Jesus, he acknowledged that. He calls him Lord. Now, to call him Lord is, is a way of recognizing who he is, his objective position over, over all of creation. Not only that, but that he is the king of the Jews, which means that he is the Messiah, the one that they had been long waiting for and who would suffer and die and rise again and someday lead the nation of Israel. He believes that the Messiah is dying on the cross as Savior and will rise again from the dead to rule. So I think that is implied when he says, Lord, and he recognizes who he is, and he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He recognizes that Jesus is the King, the Messiah, and that he will be triumphant over this death and he will rule one day. So again, he's processing these things correctly. He believes that Jesus can grant eternal security together uh, with him. In other words, he believed that Jesus could guarantee his eternal security because he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And only Jesus could offer that kingdom and only Jesus could secure that kingdom for this guilty man. So those are some of the things that the thief seemed to know at this point as he processed what was going on around him. You know, there were others there who also recognized some things about Jesus, like the centurion, you remember, who said, truly, this is the Son of God. And those uh, others, there were others in the crowd who were saying, this is a righteous man. So it wasn't just a thief in his take on things, but it was uh, many of the other folks seemed to be influenced by what was going on. Maybe Jesus's presentation and the teaching they've heard about him. Let's talk about what the thief does not do. 
because we want to be clear about how he was saved. First of all, he expressed no moral claim to Jesus' favor. He knew that he had no way of insisting upon Jesus giving him favor. He didn't deserve it. He had no moral claim to it. He had no arrogance, no pride in his own standing or his own doing or his own accomplishment. Secondly, he does no good works that he could claim as merit before God. At least at the, on the cross he couldn't do any good works, could he? There are so many people around the world and, and the United States that think that they can have eternal life, get to heaven by the works that they do. If they just do enough good works, if they do more good works than bad works, or they do more good works than their neighbor, works always seems to get in there somehow. And there's always a list that needs to be kept, and they think if they can keep that list, then they can be good enough to get in heaven. But what list could a thief nailed to a cross offer Jesus? Nothing, right? He does not prove that he does or would turn from his sins. You see, a lot of people believe that in order to be saved, you have to turn from your sins. You have to stop doing wrong and start a different kind of life. But the gospel says that we are saved by grace through faith. Faith is believing, receiving, trusting in what Jesus Christ has done for us. Faith is not turning from sins. And so a lot of people preach that repentance means that we turn from our sins. But the word repentance means a change of mind. The thief on the cross couldn't, wasn't in a position, literally, to, change, to turn from his sins too late. But he could change his mind. And so in that sense, he really could repent. But he had no good works there. Uh, to show that he was turning from, from his sins. He has no good works to prove that he could persevere in his new faith. You know, there's some theological systems and some teaching that says, well, you, you can believe in Jesus Christ, but we don't know if you're saved unless you persevere to the end of your life. You have to persevere in, until you die, because if you sin before you die, then it shows you never really were saved. I don't want to pick on any particular, that, those, that view has a certain label, I'll just let that go, but that's the view. And so you can, you can believe in Jesus and hope that you're saved, but you won't know until you die. And it's a, kind of a sad way to live, isn't it? Well, this man had no works that he could persevere to the end of his faith. Uh, he had no works to show. He does not promise to be baptized, and he's not baptized. Obviously. You know, there are some in the world who teach that you have to be baptized in order to be saved, baptismal regeneration. Many, many people believe that in our world and different religious views, but this thief was never baptized, was he? He does not indicate that he's making Jesus master of all of his life. You know, there's a view, and I've written quite a bit about it, uh, called Lordship Salvation that says that you, can be, you have to be saved by making Jesus master of your life. You have to turn over everything to him so that he, is, he has complete control of your life and only then can you be saved. And they would probably get that because the thief called Jesus Lord. And so they would read into that that he was making Jesus master of his life. That's really reading too much into the scripture. What he's just doing is recognizing who Jesus is. He's addressing him by his title. Lord, Lord Kurios means ruler. It, it's, kind, it's the same word that we would uh, use in, if we said sir. For example, in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, it says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the word Kurios. And, and they make a big deal of that and say, you have to believe in Jesus as your Lord. But you know what? In the verse before that, Acts 16, 30, when the, when the, during the earthquake, when Paul and Silas were in the jail, and the, the jailer said, Lords, what must, uh, Lords, what must I do to be saved? He uses the plural, same word. He's just saying, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And then they say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't a call to surrender life. It was a call to believe in who he said he was. So, so the, the thief wasn't surrendering himself in the sense of making Jesus Lord. He was just recognizing that he was Lord in the objective sense. 
He does not make the commitments of discipleship. There are many people who teach that in order to be saved, you have to keep the commitments of discipleship. And what are they? Well, Jesus named a bunch of them, but some of them are, uh, he said, follow me, take up your cross, deny yourself, love me more than your family, and so forth. And there are people today who insist you cannot be saved unless you do those things. And they say nobody, they say everybody who's saved is a disciple. Therefore, if somebody is not following Jesus obediently, they're not saved. And it causes a lot of confusion about the gospel, a lot of confusion about assurance of salvation, and just a lot of confusion um, in people's lives. But this man makes no commitments of discipleship. He can't say to Jesus, I'll follow you everywhere, I'll obey you, I'll deny. <laughs> well, he's taking up a cross, isn't he? But um, that was not his choice. He shows no growth in sanctification. Some people say, well, if you're really saved, then you'll grow, you'll bear fruit, you'll do good works. And I believe Christians do, but I don't believe that we always see it. You know, good works and fruit is not always what we see. Sometimes it's what we don't, sometimes it's unseen. It's not only what people do, but sometimes it's what they're not doing. You know, somebody has a foul mouth, becomes a Christian, and you don't hear as much language. Well, that could be fruit, that could be growth, right? So it's a very subjective thing and hard to measure and a very, it's no, there's no way of proving our salvation by our work or growth in sanctification. We call it sanctification, the Christian life. This man had no opportunity to grow. He doesn't ask for temporal deliverance from crucifixion. He's not coming to Jesus uh, for anything except to acknowledge who he is. He's not asking him for um, a, a good life or for healing or to get him off the cross. You know, there's this theology called prosperity theology, come to Jesus and Jesus will make you rich and he'll heal you and, and all these things. And so many people around the world come to Christianity in, with that temporal <laughs> desire to gain more in this life. This thief knew that he was asking and getting nothing in this life he was looking at the life to come. And then he does not express his faith verbally in a way that we would expect. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He doesn't use any of the Christianese or jargon that we would often hear that would confirm to us that somebody is saved. This man just has an assurance that Jesus is who he said he is. And he's asking, I think, for the mercy that he could be in his kingdom with him. So he's expressing his faith in him in a very unique way that we often don't hear today. Well, those are some of the th things the thief does not do. Uh, what about some of the things that the thief does? Let's make some observations there. First of all, he changes his mind from being a scoffer towards Jesus to acknowledging him as the Lord. Perhaps at, at some point he was uh, agreeing with the other scoffer, but now he is acknowledging who Jesus actually is. He expresses his change of mind by a request of faith in what Jesus could do for him. It shows that he, has, he understands and agrees what Jesus can do for him, that is, give him eternal life in paradise. Now, the view of death then in those days was that you either go to Hades or you go to paradise. You'll see that in Luke chapter 16 in the parable of uh, the man who uh, dies, the rich man Lazarus. One is in separated in Hades and the other is in paradise. So that was their view of the afterlife. Um, and he expresses to Jesus that Jesus, he knew Jesus could do that for him. And he believed that Jesus is the Messiah King and asks for a future with him in his kingdom. So there's no doubt when we look at the story that this criminal on the cross had his mind totally changed to see who Jesus was and that Jesus could have a future for him in the midst of the most hopeless situation that this life could have brought him and that he could have a future with him in the kingdom. I think that gives hope to all of us, no matter what we've done as sinners, to know that God can forgive any sin, no matter where we are in life, no matter how late it is in life, that we can, be, we can be with Jesus Christ forever. 
So what do we learn about salvation from this story? Well, God's grace saves the worst of sinners. We don't know exactly what this guy did, but he was a bad guy. He did something bad because crucifixion was the cruelest form of death and the ultimate uh, punishment that the Romans could meter out. He had done something very, very bad, probably to be there, but yet Jesus was willing to save him on the basis of his faith. God saves the worst of sinners. I have a friend I was speaking with last week and he just did an interview with Jeffrey Dahmer's pastor for his podcast. Jeffrey Dahmer, remember him? He's the guy that used to kill people, chop them up and eat them. But his, he talked to his pastor, his pastor's convinced that he was saved. And so my friend was interviewing him for his podcast. And my friend, I said, are you convinced that Jeffrey Dahmer was saved? And he says, everything I hear sounds like he was. The worst of sinners. Can God forgive something that bad? If so, he can forgive anything that you and I have done, right? God's grace will be given to anyone who asks for it through faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. And that's essentially what this guy did. It was the thief was essentially asking for God's mercy. Remember me. Reminds us of the story of the woman at the well where Jesus says uh, she's looking for literature. He promises living water. He says, if you would just ask me, I would give you living water. Just ask. It's there for the asking. No hoops to jump through, no works to do. No sins to turn from. He never asked the woman at the well to turn from a sin, even though he knew she was living in sin. Just ask for living water. That living water comes inside and starts bubbling up. It changes your life. And we see also that grace is essentially unfair. This man had sinned evidently all of his life and ended up with the due penalty for his sin. Is it really fair for him to be forgiven at the last minute like that when he had not lived for Jesus the rest of his life? I remember explaining the gospel to someone very close to me in my family and, and I explained that we're all sinners and we've sinned against God and that Jesus lived a righteous life, a perfect life, and yet God took his life instead of ours. And she said, that's not fair. I said, you got it. Grace is never fair. Grace is an absolutely free gift of God, unconditional, no strings attached. That's what grace is. It's a gift. If we get a gift because we gave a gift, that's an obligation. If we get a gift out of nowhere, that's grace and it's not deserved and it's not really fair. But grace is never fair. When I pastored a church, I had a man in my my congregation, his father was dying of cancer. He didn't go to the church. The father was dying of cancer. And my friend told me, he said, well, my, my dad's really close to death. And I've tried to explain the gospel to him. And he said to me, he said, David, I've not lived for the Lord my whole life. I've done what I wanted to do. I've done a lot of wrong things. It's not fair for me to ask him to forgive me at the end of my life. You know what I told David? Tell his father, I said, tell him about the thief on the cross. Tell him about the thief on the cross. There's hope for everybody. It's never too late. Grace gives us more than we deserve or expect. This man asked to be remembered and Jesus promised that he would be in paradise forever. I don't know what the thief expected, but Jesus certainly seemed to give more than he expected to be with him in paradise after living a life of rejection and evil to live in a wonderful kingdom with God. And then we learn that grace helps the helpless. What could this man do for himself at this point? Absolutely nothing. The Bible says that we're all dead in trespasses and sins, so what can we really do to help ourselves? There's none who does good, no, not one. The Bible says there's none righteous. So even the good things that we do without Jesus Christ really uh, uh, accomplish nothing in his, to gain his favor. We might be good in the eyes of other people, but in the eyes of God, without Christ, we all fall short of his glory. We're helpless 
before him. We need his mercy and his grace. God helps the helpless in his grace. And then Jesus came to save sinners like the criminal, not the righteous. He came to save the righteous. He came to save the, seek and to save that which was lost. Not the righteous who are self-righteous, who think that they're good and good enough to get to heaven, have their sins forgiven. He came to save those who feel like they're not good enough. Maybe you're here today and you feel like you're not good enough, that you don't deserve God's righteousness, His forgiveness, His kingdom, and you're right, you don't. That's the whole point. The whole point is God's grace says He will forgive you because of what Jesus Christ did not because of what we try to do. I was uh, watching something with my grandkids. Uh, it was Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> and uh, it was the, the, the newer, newer version with the actors in it. And uh, which is what often happens is I'm watching something with the kids and they leave the room and I'm end up watching, you know, <laughs> Paw Patrol or something by myself. So this time, I'm, now I'm watching Beauty and the Beast by myself. And, um, but there's one scene in there that just stuck out at me. And it was when, you know, the father, Belle's father, gets lost and he ends up in the castle and the beast locks him in a cell forever. And then the horse, I think, returns and Belle gets on the horse and the horse takes her to the castle and she enters into this castle. It's creepy and she finds her father in the jail cell. And at the same time, the beast reveals himself, you know, and he's getting really rough with her and mean with her. And she's pleading for her father. And he says, no, he's locked up in there forever. And, and then she says, can I just say goodbye to him? No. And then she says, forever can spare a minute. And he says, okay, he unlocks the door. And she goes into the cell, she hugs her father, she pushes him out of the cell and locks herself in. She takes his place. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? She takes the penalty. So he's free to go, but she's locked in the cell forever. But the thing that stuck out to me was that little phrase, forever can spare a minute. When we think in light of eternity, what is this life but a minute? in a short span of time. And sometimes, literally, it is just a minute that we have to share that good news with someone, like the thief on the cross or the thief with a tire around his neck soaked in kerosene. When we all face eternity, have we taken that minute to consider what Jesus has told us that God loves us. He loves us so much no matter what we've done that he sent his son Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for our sins on the cross. And then he raised him from the dead and he's alive today so that we can enjoy that eternal life with him if, if we accept that free gift of his salvation, his grace through faith, not by what we do, by faith. Well, what action points should we take away from this message? Let me give you a couple, several here. First of all, learn to share the gospel. Should you ever be in a situation where you need to share the gospel in a minute, maybe literally, learn a good gospel presentation. And there's some good ones out there. I personally always recommend Larry Moyer's Evantel presentation of Bad News, Good News. It's on his website, evantel.org. I promote it wherever I go. In fact, it's on my, uh, he let us put it on our app. And that takes a few minutes to go through, but you know, you ought to learn an elevator version. You know, you're on the elevator for a minute with somebody. Whatever we can do to get the gospel in, learn to share the gospel. Take the time to memorize something. You say, well, it will sound canned. Well, it might sound canned, but, but at least it gives you a base to start from. And when you have a base, you can go and talk about other things because you always know what to come back to. So learn to share the gospel. Never give up praying and sharing. Never give up praying and sharing. 
this thief's mother must have been might have been praying right to the end of his life when he come came to know the Lord my father came to know the Lord when he was 75 years old on his deathbed he used to take us to church drop us off but he and you know we stopped going to church I wasn't didn't become a Christian there but he would never go in with us but at the end of his life when he was on his deathbed and he couldn't get out of bed my pastor visited with him and led him to the Lord and his countenance did change and got to see some change in his life a few months before he died I had another friend I kind of grew up with he was like a brother because uh, my ba mother babysitted him all the time his name was Walter but Walter during his teenage years well, we all got involved with bad stuff but I became a Christian at the age of 19 he went on his way doing drugs and alcohol and his whole life was a wreck his whole life was a wreck nothing but drugs alcohol poverty and he would call me all the time and argue about Christianity and argue with me and give me a hard time this went on I mean this went on <laughs> after seminary when well, I'm still a pastor but he considered himself like a brother to me but I pray for him every day. He then he's then he's telling me he's I finally I lost touch with him for a few years and I finally reestablished contact a couple years ago. He had had several heart attacks, several strokes, on oxygen. He knew he was near the end of his life. But he told me he said, you know, I, I believe what you've been telling me now. It's the end of his life, but I never gave up praying for him. Just about every day. I sometimes forget to pray, but just like you, but just about every day praying for Walter. And I think I'll see him in heaven based on his testimony. So we should share the gospel with some urgency also, because time is short. We have this minute today, but we don't know about tomorrow. Jesus may come. Death can be a breath away, it can be a car ride away, it can be so close our world is a very uncertain thing and life is very uncertain we should have a sense of urgency and if there's anyone listening today either here or online or later uh, know that Jesus offers that eternal life to anyone on the basis of faith in what he has done for us that we could never do for ourselves and you can come to know Jesus Christ as Savior by simply placing your faith in what he has done. Lord, I am a sinner. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for rising from the dead. And now I want to ask you for the gift of eternal life. God is not a liar and he will keep that promise. Can I pray with you then this morning? Perhaps you have doubts about your own salvation, about where you will spend eternity. I wonder if today you've heard something that would make a difference to you. And you would say, Lord, from now on, I'm trusting in you. I'm not going to doubt my salvation. I'm going to believe your word. I believe Jesus is my Savior. Is there anyone who would say that for the first time and just stick your hand up and let me see who you might be? You encourage me. Let me know that you're listening. Just stick your hand up real quick. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, praise the Lord, you know. You can be sure that you're going to heaven if you're trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And we thank you, Lord, for that gift of eternal life that can never be lost. And thank you for these who have uh, so expressed their, that in their heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. For more resources or to help spread the message of God's life-changing grace, visit our website at gracelife.org. We'd love to hear from you. Send us a message at simplybygrace at gracelife.org. See you next time.